Now, as I was in my hometown of Krasno, I tried to get a room to stay in so as not to burden Mrs. Cal. I couldn't get a room even in our own building. It was occupied by different people who had moved from the villages into the town. <clears throat> and all apartments our building were occupied. Finally, there was a gentleman, Mr. Morgenstern, who had been with us at the air base, and he had survived somewhere. And he got a room, and I roomed with him there for the few weeks that I was in Crosno. Then when my uncle came, and he told us that he was liberated the Book of Wealth, was taken by the Patton Army westward, because Buchenwald was going to be ceded to the Soviets and be part of East Germany. So they were taken to Landsberg, which is a city not far from Munich, and there was a large DP camp. He had all these goodies with him, which we did not see in the East. He came with two friends from his hometown who had worked in the same factory and were shipped to the same concentration camp in Buchenwald. About a day or two days later, my cousin Black Joe showed up. He is the one who had been in Shebnia, was sent to Auschwitz, you remember. From there, there he worked in the Buna Works, which was the IG Fountain Industry factory. Then when they evacuated Auschwitz, he was sent to Buchenwald. And he came. And so my uncle decided that we all should go back to the west and to Landsberg, to that DP camp, where the Jewish organizations were assisting the Jews, and there was everything there. Now, what they suggested is that whatever money we had, and we got some money by digging up some of the silver that Black Joe had hidden of my uncle's in the basement. We sold that. We also got a little money from the furniture of my uncle's that a physician by the name of Hodunko had kept, and he gave us some money. Then I sold the... Uh, putty making machine to a pole there and he gave us some money. With this money my uncle and his two friends from the West suggested that we buy script. Script was the American uh, money that soldiers were using in Europe that they could exchange when they came to America into regular dollars. Now there was quite a few script to be bought because the refugees as they were returning from Germany had some scripts with them. So we went ahead and bought those scripts and my uncle and his two friends and Black Joe took a small piece of luggage, fashioned a double bottom, and stuck that script, those script dollars, in that double bottom. And we were going to go west. 
Well, how did they go west since the uh, borders were, were closed? The Iron Curtain wasn't yet, hadn't yet descended, but we had to go through the border. So my father and these two gentlemen with him, who came from a small town, Gorlice, which was right on the border, decided that we should go to Gorlice, where my, fa my uncle knew the mayor, and get from him a permit to cross the border into Czechoslovakia. The mayors were allowed to issue permits for 15 kilometers, which is approximately 10 miles across the border. So my uncle gave him a package of Chesterfield cigarettes, which were highly valued in Poland, and he gave us a permit to cross the border. We hired a guy with a uh, buggy, and we went across the border late at night where the border guards were sleeping, when the border guards were sleeping. We crossed the border, but instead of going 15 kilometers, we went all the way to a town called Bardiov, which was what is now Slovakia. There, we knew that there is a Jewish family that is in the wine business, had been in the wine business, and they were somewhere, somehow, distantly related to us. So we came to Bardiov, and we found that family. We went there, and they, we found also there two kids from my hometown, Mr. Taller and Mr. Schwebel, both of whom survived in hiding in Krosno. And they were related to these blind people. So we were there, and we were going to go west and cross the border into West Germany and go to Munich and Landsberg, to the DP camp. We went to the station and tried to board the train. The wine people gave us the money. As we were at the station, and Bardiuf is a relatively smaller town, the police was there. They wanted to see our identification. Since we came from Poland, and we only had the 15-kilometer permit, they took us to jail. They threw us in the basement, and there we were all night long. They wrote long reports accusing us of being Polish spies. Now, mind you, there was a communist regime there now. Well, we protested that we are not communist spies. We were, that we were coming from the West and we are going back. Well, it didn't help. We sat in jail all night. The white people found out, and they apparently delivered a case of wine to the police there. And the following day, they sent us on a horse-drawn wagon with a policeman back across the border to Poland. As we were riding out of that town, my uncle gave the policeman a package of Chesterfields. He was very grateful for that. That was worth gold. So he told us, listen, go wherever you want. <laughs> I don't know. And I'm going back home to Bardiov. So we turned around and went back to the wine people. The white people told us that the Barley of train station is not really a good station to board the train, that we should go to Kosice. Kosice is also called in 
German Kaschau and the Jewish Kaschau, which used to be Hungary, was now part of Czechoslovakia. And that is a much bigger station, and we will not be as recognized there. So they took us to Kosice. There we boarded the train and were going westward. <clears throat> As we were going westward, we came to the demarcation border between the American zone of Czechoslovakia and the Soviet zone of occupation of Czechoslovakia. And that was around near Karlsbad, which is a famous resort in Czechoslovakia. It was already dark. There was no light in the train, and all of a sudden, a Czech policeman and a Soviet officer entered the train, and they want to see our identification. I had the identification from Brindlitz, from the... From, uh, Schindler's camp, and it was it was typed in in German and in Czech. It was given to us by the prisoners, the leaders, the prisoner leaders, when we were liberated after liberation. My uncle had a letter from the DP camp in Landsberg that he is going back east to look for family to help him and assist him in his travel. So he had that and he showed it to the policeman. So they let my uncle and me go and they took off the two guys, the friends of my uncle and my cousin Black Joe. They, instead of taking their luggage with them, left their luggage with us. So now we were burdened with our own small pieces and theirs. And those two guys, my uncle's friends, had larger pieces of luggage. Well, we couldn't do anything. The train continued. They were off. We arrived at a station, and I believe it was Ham, uh, around, at, on the border, the actual border of Czechoslovakia and West Germany. Not the demarcation line, but the actual border. The actual border was already on the American side, but we didn't know that. The train stopped and wasn't going any further. So we got off the train and there were two border policemen there. And those border policemen took us in into the into the border little house and they wanted to see our identification. So I showed them mine and my uncle showed them his, showed them his, and they wanted to see what we have in the luggage. Now I didn't <coughs> pack the luggage, I didn't have anything. It was the two guys and Black Joe that packaged this and made the double bottom. They opened it. There were a few rags on top. They took that out and without looking anymore, they stuck their hands in the pockets, pulled out knives and cut straight into the bottom. And there was all the script in there. They shook it all out and they started counting. They counted the money, then gave me and my uncle a slip of paper to sign. I didn't know what I was signing, but whatever it was, my uncle and I signed. They took the script and left. So now we were sitting there, it was around after midnight, and there wasn't a human being around. It was dark. 
after a few hours sitting there, I told my uncle, look, if we are going to be sitting here and they come back, they will throw us in jail. Why don't we just simply escape from here? Since the train stopped here, beyond it is probably West Germany. So we decided to do that. We walked out, there wasn't a sound, there wasn't a human being around, and walked there thinking that we are going towards West Germany. It started getting a light a little bit. There were forests all around there. When we saw a German, we recognized it as a German because the Czechs had all Germans wear band, armbands to make them just like the Jews had to wear, to recognize them as Germans. So I saw that German and I asked him, I approached him and I said to him, where is the border? Where is West Germany? So he says, you were just in West Germany. You are now back in Czechoslovakia. Well, I was so thankful to him that I had a gold watch of my mother's. I gave it to him. I shouldn't have, but I was very thankful to him that he pointed us in the right direction. So we turned around and went in the opposite direction. We got to a road and it was through a forest. So we were walking, my uncle and I, alongside that road and whenever we heard a car, a jeep going by, I told my uncle to drop on the ground so they won't catch us. Of course, these were all American soldiers, but we didn't know that these were American soldiers. They probably would have given us a lift, <laughs> but we didn't know. So we were walking along there until we came to a small town. That town was Ham, on the border between actual Germany and Czechoslovakia. Were you carrying luggage? And we had no luggage. So we got there and looked around for a place and we found out that there was an office for refugees, for German returnees from concentration camps. So we went in there and there were German refugees there and they immediately gave us a slip to a hotel to stay overnight. They gave us slips to get a meal and get breakfast the following day. And they were extremely nice and gave us tickets to take the train to Regensburg, which was the large city in Bavaria there on the other side of the border. So we had a good night's sleep there, we had a good meal, and the following day after breakfast, we took the train to Regensburg. We came to Regensburg, we wanted to see whether there is a Jewish community there. So we found out that there was indeed a Jewish community there that had formed. So we went there. There we found two people from my hometown, the Bynes, B-I-M. Jan Bein, we called him, his name now is Jack Bein, and Joseph, Joseph Bein, we called him, Joseph Bein. And these two guys apparently were liberated around there, and they told us that the head of the group of Jews in the Regensburg, the Jewish community, is Yidalo Salomon. Yidalo Salomon comes from Krasna, from my hometown. But there was no way to get to Yidalo Salomon. There were lines of people lining up there to try to get to Yidalo Salomon for whatever. 
So these two bimes told my uncle and me that they will accommodate us when they are staying there with the German family, a very nice German family. So they accommodated us there. And then we took the train to Landsberg. We arrived in Landsberg into that DP camp that my uncle was there. He had roomed with about six other people there, including these two guys whom they took off the train. They weren't there, of course. Neither was Black Joe. They had been taken off the train before. We didn't know what happened to them. When we got there, so we went to see the administration and they put me in into that same uh, room. About two days later, Black Joe and the two guys show up. What happened to us, they took him off the train and they wouldn't let them cross the demarcation line. So what they did is they found some Jews and they found out that they are taking the Jews across the border. So they are taking them across the border and now they are here in Landsberg. They want to know what happened to us. Where is their luggage? I told them what happened. Of course, Black Joe, my cousin, believed me. The two friends of my uncle from Gorlitzer did not believe me. They accused me of having stolen their money. I was getting so enraged that I could have grabbed a chair and hit one of them especially, a short guy, Manus was his first name. I called him Manusel. I could have hit him over the head. The other guy was a tall fellow, and he was a sickly individual. He eventually died there within a year of tuberculosis. And he was a sort of a quiet type, but Manusel was the leader. He would not believe me. And in front of all the people there, he accused me of having stolen his monies. He wanted me to go and see the rabbi. I forgot the uh, rabbi's name. He was a Hungarian rabbi there at the camp. <clears throat> and he lived in a building across from the camp. I didn't want to go. But my uncle pleaded with me, let's go. We go to the rabbi. They insist that I swear by the Bible that I didn't take their money. Well, I had no choice. I swore by the Bible I didn't take their money. I didn't think they still believed me, frankly. And so we stayed in that DP camp. There in the morning you got breakfast, at lunch you got lunch, at dinner time you got dinner and the people were standing in line and being handed out these alms. They also placed with clothing and so on. The head of the camp or the chief supervisor was some American from the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. There was a hospital because this used to be an SS uh, camp there. So anyway, I was there. And after about or so a week or so, or two weeks, my cousin, Black Joe, who was a mechanic by trade, got a job teaching at the art school. I dreamt of going and continuing my studies. So I found out from some other kids that were in the same predicament as I that they would go to Munich 
and see whether we could not continue our studies there. The American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee had an office in one of the Munich suburbs in passing. <clears throat> the head of that was a Professor Jocelyn. I remember his name very well. He had been Professor of Sociology at NYU. He was the head of that. And we then went there to find out what we could do to be admitted to study. I also, in the meantime, went to the high school in Landsberg, together with another girl from the same town that my uncle was from, to get some help in studying so that we can qualify to enter the university. So there were two teachers, one a teacher of mathematics, and one a teacher of literature, and so on, and we gave them our rations, and we every day, they spent time with us, teaching us, and they gave us then a letter of maturity. We went back to Dr. Jocelyn in passing. He gave us some forms to be examined by the chief physician who was an American in uniform at the hospital in Landsberg. And he had to sign that he was examining us in chemistry and in physics and so on, and then signed those forms for us. My uncle was with me each time and went back to passing to Professor Jocelyn with all these forms. Now he gave us a letter to the university, to the dean, to help us in entering the university. I couldn't see myself staying in Landsberg and hand, getting the handouts of breakfast, lunch, and supper for the rest of my life. I had to do something. And it, I wouldn't have minded to study anything that was available. The medical school, we found out, had not reopened. The university had been bombed, but not very heavily. So it was a heavily reopened. And I was simply too anxious to start studying. So in passing, there was a school of architecture. They were open. So I thought, I'm going to go there. And I'm going to apply to the school of architecture. As I was picking up an application from there, I found out from other kids in my predicament that the medical school is going to open in a week or so. And there was already formed a Jewish students' union in Munich. And I went there and joined them. Anyway, the medical faculty opened. And I just tore up the application for the architecture school and signed up and went to the university. There I had an appointment with the dean. The dean interviewed me and I found there, I met there, a young man from Budapest who had been liberated in Bergen-Belsen. And he was there also for an appointment with the dean of the medical faculty to be admitted to the university. So we introduced each to one to each other. And he had apparently already had studied and he had one semester of medicine in Budapest. <clears throat> so we both went into the dean's office separately, 
and we both got letters of admission to the medical faculty. So now we had to find a place to live. So we decided we'll go together to find a place to live. And we did. He got a place not far from where I got a place and so on. Anyway, we started studying and to make a long story short, about a year later or so, my uncle, who was still in the DP camp in Landsberg, came one day to visit me in Munich. And he told me that two Jewish fellows had shown up at that DP camp and apparently were looking for Alexander and for Sam Bialovlas. My uncle wasn't there when they came, but Manasul was there with his friend. And they asked, they inquired from these two Jewish guys what he needs the Bialovlasses for. So they told them that the Bialovlasses had money taken away at the border. And they can retrieve this money, but they need our signatures, my uncle's and mine. Well, Manasul said, it's his money. It's their money. These two guys told him, look, I don't know whose money it is. I need the signature of these two guys, Alexander and Sam Yalovlas. When my uncle came there, Manasul went over to him to try to talk to me to sign. So my uncle came to Munich. And he wanted me to sign. I was as mad as hell at this monosyl. And I said in the Yiddish, Akipura this bet, Abi Devansen. That means sacrifice the bet as long as the bed bugs go with it. <laughs> I said, I don't want the money, but I don't want monosyl to have it. He accused me. He still did not believe me. Well, my uncle pleaded with me. And I signed. Well, I got a $50 bill, and my uncle got a $50 bill. My cousin, Black Joe, got something, I don't know how much. And Manasul and the other guy got each $100, because they had more money. Well, I kept these $50 in my pocket thinking when I will immigrate to the States, I would like to buy myself a camera there. The dollar was highly valuable. A dollar was 125 marks. <clears throat> a package of cigarettes was more than 100 marks. For one package of cigarettes, in my care package, I paid the rent for the whole month. <clears throat> anyway, what happened was, I'm going to make that short, and I'm going to finish this. <laughs> when I was ready to go to the United States, I wanted to exchange my dollars into marks so that I can buy the camera. So there was a Jewish kid in Munich who was a, uh, a refugee who survived in the Soviet Union in Siberia. And when they were released, came over to the West and he lived in Munich. And he was dealing on the black market in Munich on the Mailstrasse. The Mail Street was the center of the black market. There were Jews galore there, all the returnees that were dealing in the black market. So I approached him, Jankala was his name, Eichenstein. He's not alive anymore. He was a wonderful guy. 
and he told me to go to the Mailstrasse and see a friend of his who would give me a good deal. So I go to the Mailstrasse, I pull out my $50, I find this guy, I hand him the $50, he takes one look at it, puts his nail under the zero, pulls the zero off. This was a $5 bill with a pasted on zero. So I was thinking, what a bunch of Ganoven these are. Now, mind you, they can take a poor refugee who has no more than the 50 bucks, you know, and give him, I mean, who has no, uh, no money and give him a $5 bill with a zero on top of it. It reminded me of a story of a rabbi who was also a judge. And when two litigants came to him, the rabbi was sitting at the head of the table and the litigants were sitting on the sides. And the old county rabbis used to wear pantoffles, you know, like house shoes instead of sh shoes. So the rabbi was used to pull off his pantoffles, have one on this side and one on this side, and after, uh, and when he, the, each litigant who wanted to win would put money into his shoe on the right and on the left. And when the rabbi put his feet in there, wherever he felt the money, that's the guy who won. <laughs> and one time a guy got smart and he put in some pieces of sheet metal in there. The rabbi thought, well, that's guilt, and the guy won. After they left, he took his shoe off, and he sees it's just, he was cheated. He says, is this a belt mit Ganoven? Is this a world with Ganifs? <laughs> <laughs> that's what that reminded me of. I'm going to quit right here. Oh. Because it will take too long for me to go more. So, uh, 37 minutes. Uh, let's see. Let's see what we're going to say. You could say something about that. Uh, this is what I wrote for Bob Sutz, or something, and then, and then just read it right off. When I tell, it's only oh, to start. now, uh, this is a brief biography which I wrote for Bob Sutz yes. a while ago and typed it for him. So I'm going to read it to you. My name is Alexander B. B stands for Bialovlas, my previous name, White. Bialovlas means white hair. The hair has been cut off and white was left. I was born in 1923 in a small town of Krosno, which you call a shtetl in Yiddish, in Poland, the past region of Galicia, which was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire up to after World War I. My family consisted of my parents, two brothers, and one sister. We had multiple relatives uncles, aunts, and cousins in the same or the neighboring small towns as was usual in those days where relatives lived in proximity to one another. We led peaceful lives, attended secular and the religious schools until the outbreak of World War II when the Nazi armies entered Poland September 1st, 1939. Masses of people, especially Jews, tried to escape eastward ahead of the Nazi highly mechanized armies. The going on foot and horse-drawn carriages was very difficult under constant strafing by German dive bombers and roads clogged with refugee traffic. <clears throat> and the retreating Polish military. With German armies on our heels, my family decided to stop running and settle temporarily 
down in a small town of Dinov, only about 40 kilometers from my hometown of Krasno. Within a day or two, German units entered Dinov after already having occupied Krasno. My father and a few others from Krasno hired a peasant with a horse-drawn buggy and decided to return home where we had left everything open save a few small items that we took along with us. My mother with us children, my youngest brother, nine years old, were left in Dinov and my father would send for us later. A detachment of German infantry unit entered Dinov the following day but moved east two days later. Our first experience of horrible atrocities against Jewish civilians came when a unit of a Zonderkommando of SS entered the town one day later. <clears throat> All male Jews between the ages of 16 and 60 were ordered to report to the central city square. Suddenly, an SS man with outstretched arm and a revolver kicked open our door with his boots and ordered all men out into the central square. My mother told them that I was only 14 years old. I was actually 16, and he let me stay. Next door, however, another boy of 16 was ordered out to the square. Without going into details, we found out the following day that all assembled were taken out to a forested ravine at the edge of town and machine gunned to death. The 16-year-old from next door passed out as the shooting started. He dropped to the ground with the victims falling on top of him. When the shooters left, he walked himself out from that pile and returned completely bloodied, relating the events that occurred. Soon another man by the name of Shamroth from my own hometown entered our house with a bullet wound in the chest and related the same story. The same evening, the Jewish temple in the town was put to the torch. As we found out upon the return home later on, the same fate was met by two of my first cousins who, while escaping from the German armies, were caught up by them in another neighboring town and were killed there the same way. It was difficult to believe and incomprehensible that such massacres of innocent civilians could be committed by a civilized culture, cultural Western society in the 20th century. Following our return home, where such massacres did not occur, we settled to the usual known hardships of the Jewish people under Nazi occupation. Judenrats which is Jewish community elders, forced labor, starvation, the wearing of the Star of David armbands, curfews, sporadic shootings, and dehumanization prevailed during the rest of 1939 and 1940 until June 1941. June 1941, Hitler's armies invaded the Soviet Union. After having defeated the Allies in France, occupied Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Norway, the Balkans, and saving their Italian allies, allies in North Africa. As the German troops advanced rapidly eastward, reaching the outskirts of Moscow by mid-December, massive killings were taking place in the occupied areas by well-organized Sonder commandos, assisted by native nationalist 
factions, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, the Romanians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, and other Jew haters. Jews in the hundreds of thousands were massacred. The old, the young, the women, the babies, in contrast to 1939, when we thought that the worst had already occurred. Still worse things were to come in 1942, when mobile and stationary gas chambers were built for the killing not of thousands but of millions. The first euphemistically called resettlement took place in Krosno in the summer of 1942, when approximately 80% of our town's Jews, including relatives of mine, were gassed in the gas chambers of Belzec. Until that time, our town Jews were mostly intact, except for sporadic shootings for minor infractions. Between July and December of 1942, 80% of our Jews would be dead, including my mother and sister, who were shot in a forested area near Krosno after they had been spared the gas chamber in Belzec, where the rest of the Jews were poisoned. December 4th, 1942, the ghetto was liquidated. My father and I were sent to work in a labor camp at the military air base in Crossbow. One of my brothers, about one year younger than I, was sent to clean up the belongings and homes of the exterminated Jews in the neighboring towns. <clears throat> he was shot there in 1943. My youngest brother, nine years old when the time broke, when the war broke out, together with one of my cousin and his five-year-old boy, were transferred to a ghetto in a larger town named Jeshov, in German, Reichshof, from where they were sent to Auschwitz in 1943 and gassed there. That left my father, the only survivor, of my own family by the end of 1943. In January of 1944, the air base labor camp, <coughs> where 124 hours Jews worked, was all that liquidated. And my father and I were sent to a concentration camp called Shebnia, near our hometown, and from there about a week later to the concentration camp of Krakow, Płaszow. <clears throat> there I lost my father in, a, in selection for the gas chamber in Auschwitz in May of 1944. This left me the only survivor of my immediate family. After being assigned to open the mass graves in Krakow, Płaszow, as the Soviets were nearing Krakow, and burning the corpses in order to erase the signs of atrocities, I was ordered to Oskar Schindler's factory in Sudetenland via the concentration camp of Gross Rosen, where fortunately we were kept only for a few days. It was the worst I had experienced. At Schindler's and under his protection, I worked there until liberation, May 8, 1945. This, in a nutshell, is my story without giving you details. <clears throat>